All right. Good afternoon. This is Aaron Lentz. Uh, I'm an assistant professor with the Division of Urology at Duke University and a practitioner at Duke Urology of Raleigh. Uh, and today, uh, Dr. Viviano and I are going to give you an overview of some uh, issues pertaining to erectile dysfunction and low testosterone, two issues with male wellness that we're both very uh, interested in. So um, erectile dysfunction has been defined as the inability to achieve or maintain an erection sufficient for satisfactory sexual performance. Uh, and what we know now is that erectile dysfunction may signal the presence or progression of underlying disease, including cardiovascular disease, heart disease, vascular insufficiency, and depression. Uh, we also know that the earlier these consequences of these risk factors become known to the patient, the greater the opportunity to address and modify the risk factors at an earlier stage. It seems evident now that uh, studies are reporting uh, a greater increase in the prevalence and severity of erectile dysfunction, especially with the increasing age of the baby boomer population. The most conservative projections calculated that the worldwide prevalence of ED would probably increase uh, about 111 percent by the year 2025. The relationship between erectile dysfunction and other disorders such as obesity and diabetes, which are themselves reaching epidemic proportions, may also contribute to the increase in ED worldwide. Over the past few years, we've made a lot of progress in managing sexual dysfunction and also determining some of the risk factors associated with it. These include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, low testosterone, diabetic disorders, anemia, coronary artery disease, and also peripheral vascular disease. Uh, also factors such as uh, lifestyle choices including smoking, alcohol, and drug abuse can also increase the risk of developing ED. By and large, the most common cause of erectile dysfunction uh, with primary erectile dysfunction are vascular disorders and about 30% related to diabetes. Uh, other problems including endocrine problems, neurologic causes, uh, pelvic surgery, radiation, or trauma can also contribute. So vascular disease in the United States especially is a prominent cause of erectile dysfunction and is often the result of medical disorders that affect arterial blood flow. Among men 50 years of age or greater, atherosclerotic disease causes an estimated 40% of cases of erectile dysfunction. Men with cholesterol or lipid abnormalities may experience ED before significant vascular stenosis occurs in penile arteries. Risk factors associated with atherosclerotic disease such as smoking, diabetes, and hypertension are also risk factors for ED. So ED can play a central role in helping healthcare providers identify and manage cardiovascular disease. The penile arteries are small, making them more susceptible to occlusion and erectile dysfunction. Men often report changes in their erectile dysfunction before they have any knowledge of cardiovascular disease. 57% of men in one study who had coronary artery bypass surgery reported erectile dysfunction before surgery, and over 60% of men in another study who were hospitalized for a heart attack experienced erectile dysfunction before being hospitalized. In this study, more than 12,000 men with self-reported erectile dysfunction were compared with a similar number of men without erectile dysfunction. Men reporting ED had almost twice the risk of a heart attack. Men over the age of 40 with ED had three to four times the risk of a heart attack uh, compared with men uh, younger without erectile dysfunction. We also know that erectile dysfunction is strongly linked to diabetes. Several factors contribute to the development of erectile dysfunction in men with diabetes, including increased age, duration of disease, and poor blood sugar control. 
In one U.S. study, 20% of men over the age of 21 years of age with diabetes for greater than 10 years reported a history of erectile dysfunction. The longer the duration of diabetes, the greater the prevalence of erectile dysfunction. In one study, the prevalence and severity of erectile dysfunction were evaluated in patients with high blood pressure. Compared with the age-matched general population, results showed that erectile dysfunction is more prevalent and more severe among patients with high blood pressure. It was speculated that these findings were associated with underlying vascular disease. It can also be related to the side effects of medications, uh, particularly beta blockers and thiazide diuretics. We all know that smoking is bad for your health, but it's also bad for your erections. Multiple studies have concluded that there's a strong link between smoking and ED. The six largest studies found that 40% of men with erectile dysfunction and only 28% of those in the general population were current smokers. The association between smoking and ED probably results from impairment of smooth muscle relaxation of the penis. There is a lower rate of ED in former smokers than current smokers. So the management of erectile dysfunction is typically a stepwise approach. We always start with an initial assessment, including a careful history, a focused physical examination, and selected laboratory tests. Subsequent management should be goal-oriented, and we always take into account patient and partner needs and preferences. The first approach to treating erectile dysfunction is to modify reversible causes. If ED remains unresolved, a first line of therapy is prescribed and second and third line therapies are generally reserved for patients who do not respond to one or more first line therapies. Components of first line therapy include lifestyle and drug therapy modifications that may impact erectile dysfunction, psychosocial counseling and education about sexual techniques and normal age related changes. If these conservative measures fail, the next step is oral medication. Dr. Viviana will talk later on the role of androgen replacement therapy with erectile dysfunction. So oral medications uh, have been around for over a decade and everyone has seen the uh, commercials on television for medications such as Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis. Uh, in clinical trials, the drugs significantly improved erectile dysfunction and were well tolerated. There are some uh, keys to optimizing success with these medications. Remember that sexual stimulation is very important. Don't expect to achieve an erection just from taking the pill. If a low dose doesn't work, uh, titrate up to a higher dose and do not eat a large or fatty meal prior to the medication. Also try and avoid alcohol. Uh, another, another very important part of first line therapy is to treat underlying conditions such as high cholesterol, smoking, and inactivity. If first line therapy fails, we move on to second line therapy which includes vacuum erection devices, penile injection therapy, and transurethral therapy. Vacuum erection devices are widely available and offer a medical treatment option for men reluctant to use or those who have specific contraindications to the oral therapies. Penile injection and transurethral therapies are options for those who do not respond or have specific contraindications to oral therapy. Vacuum erection devices have been around for a long time, uh, probably most commonly seen or popularized in the uh, Austin Powers movies. Um, VEDs are an option for men who are not interested in drug therapy or those who have specific contraindications to the available medical treatments. By applying negative pressure to the penis, vacuum erection devices draw blood into it. The blood is then retained by application of an elastic band to the base of the penis. Occasionally penile pain, numbness, and bruising uh, can occur, and those are the main side effects of a VED device. Most, many patients prefer vacuum erection therapy because it is available for on-demand use, lacks contraindications, and is less costly over time than other treatment options. Penile injection therapy is the preferred second-line therapy option after oral therapy. It is appropriate for those who are intolerant of or fail to respond to oral therapy or who have adverse reactions to specific oral drugs. An office trial of injection therapy is done initially to determine the patient's responsiveness. After the patient has become comfortable with the injection technique, at-home therapy can be prescribed. Advantages of penile injection therapy are that it is relatively safe and highly effective. 
Penile injection therapy is associated mainly with local side effects including pain, occasional prolonged erections, and fibrotic changes. Transurethral therapy or MUSE is an alternative to injection therapy that uses a similar medication. This can be used with or without a penile constriction device. Transurethral therapy is less invasive than injections and often produces rapid predictable erections. Unfortunately, it's significantly less effective than the intracavernosal injection therapy. Penile pain is a common complaint of patients who use transurethral alprostadil. Last but certainly not least are penile implants. Um, and quite honestly, uh, we may see a, a change in the future to penile implants becoming more of a second line therapy than a third line therapy. Uh, and that's because the overall high satisfaction and efficacy of these products. Penile implants are currently recommended for men who fail less invasive approaches to erectile dysfunction treatment. Penile implants are relatively uh, expensive and invasive, but provide the highest rate of long-term satisfaction for patients and partners of all currently available ED treatments. Recent product modifications should translate into even higher patient success and satisfaction rates. So just to summarize, we know that male sexual dysfunction is high, highly prevalent and occurs in more than 30% of men between the ages of 18 and 59. Sexual dysfunction significantly affects self-esteem, self-confidence, and quality of life for both men and their partners. It is important that these dis disorders can be identified because so many of these sexual issues may indicate or accompany serious medical conditions. In addition, many effective treatments to maintain patient sexual health and function are available. I'm now going to turn it over to my uh, partner, Dr. Charles Viviano, to discuss uh, male hypogonadism. Thanks, Aaron. Um, again, my name is Charles Viviano. I'm one of Dr. Lentz's partners here at Duke Urology of Raleigh and uh, also an assistant professor at uh, the Division of Urology at Duke University. And I'd like to shift just a little bit uh, to a, another topic that's very prominent in male health and wellness uh, called male hy hypogonadism, or more commonly known as low testosterone. Testosterone is uh, one of the many hormones that circulate in our blood. Uh, it's made from cholesterol, and it is probably the, the preeminent male hormone responsible for a lot of male characteristics, such as secondary sex characteristics, uh, including uh, male facial hair growth uh, and other components that we'll discuss at depth, in depth a little bit later. 90% of the testosterone is produced in the testicles, um, but that is under the direction of messages that are sent from various parts of the brain to the testicles to tell them when to make more or less testosterone. And this will become important again, as we see in just a little bit. It's important to note that not all of the testosterone that circulates in our blood is actually usable. Um, all of the testosterone that circulates is called the total testosterone. Only 2% of that is actually free or unbound to other molecules, typically protein molecules. Almost 38% 30, of it is bound weakly to albumin, and this testosterone is actually usable. We call the, com the combination of this albumin-bound testosterone and the free testosterone uh, bioavailable testosterone, and it comprises about 40% of the total. The other 60% is actually rather tightly bound to another protein, and it's not usually usable. And this becomes, again, important when we talk about how we measure testosterone or determine whether a, a gentleman's testosterone level is low. As seen here, that testosterone that is, that is usable or bioactive or bioavailable then goes out and has multiple effects on various tissues and organs, including muscle, brain, the prostate itself, uh, other reproductive tissues, and adipose or fat tissues. What's important to note is that, unfortunately, as men age and the testicles age, like other organs, they just simply don't work quite as well. And this, this results in the noted decrease in testosterone levels by about 1 to 2 percent every year starting roughly at age 40. While men don't go through an abrupt hormonal change like women in menopause, we tend to go through a much slower gradual change that does eventually add up over time. And this decrease in testosterone levels and aging of the testes is associated with 
uh, a decrease in the number of cells that actually make testosterone in the testicles and lower testosterone values in the morning when they are traditionally highest. Overall, what a gentleman might notice then would be changes in his sexual function, his behavior, muscle mass, and loss of secondary characteristics such as facial hair or others, other characteristics. This graph just illustrates that. Uh, the, the yellow bars show increasing uh, low levels of testosterone as a gentleman ages by decade, and the purple bars indicate a uh, decrease in the free testosterone uh, over time as a gentleman ages. It's estimated that approximately four to five million men have low testosterone, but only five percent of the affected men are currently treated. Current projections are that every year another 500,000 men or close to 500,000 men are diagnosed or have low testosterone but not all of those men are seeking current treatment. Low testosterone can be caused by several different factors. Number one, as we already discussed, primary uh, hypogonadism is when the testicles just fail or age. Secondary is when the signals from the brain uh, don't tell the testicles to make testosterone, such as when there's hypothalamic or pituitary dysfunction of the brain. And in some rare cases, uh, men are born without the ability to make some of these brain signaling molecules, such as in Kalman syndrome, or they develop a growth in the pituitary that prevents them from sending the right signals to the testicles. Testicular aging is affected by obesity, uh, severe systemic illnesses, such as diabetes, among others, and medications, which we'll review shortly. Malnutrition also contributes to aging of the testicles certain respiratory disorders, certainly testicular trauma or viral orchitis such as mumps orchitis can result in loss of testicular tissue or atrophy of the testicles that subsequently result in their decreased ability to produce testosterone. Chronic diseases can also affect the ability of the brain to send the right signals to the testicles to make more testosterone. Diseases such as cirrhosis among others. Anything that increases estrogen levels uh, will also decrease the brain's ability to send the right signals. Estrogen, as you may know, is more thought of as a female hormone, and it acts sort of opposite to testosterone, and it actually decreases testosterone uh, secretion. Alcohol abuse, anabolic steroid use, certain drugs, and obesity also increase estrogen levels, which subsequently will decrease testosterone secretion. Certain other hormone deficiencies will uh, inter interrupt the brain's ability to send the right signals to the testicles, such as hypothyroidism or hypoprolactinemia. Hypoprolactinemia can occur in the chronic use of opiates or narcotics in patients who have chronic pain. Certain medications, which we'll review shortly, can also decrease testosterone uh, secretion. Inflammatory diseases, such as Crohn's disease and inflammatory arthritis, and certain genetic disorders, as I've mentioned earlier. Several medications can decrease the amount of testosterone that is produced. More commonly, uh, the medications that we note are, again, the opiates or narcotics, commonly no known as perhaps Percocet or Vicodin. These are taken by patients who have chronic pain. These medications have been shown to decrease the brain's ability to, to send the correct signals yeah. to tell the testicles to make more testosterone. There are some thiazide diuretics that Dr. Lentz mentioned earlier in his discussion of erectile dysfunction that also decrease testosterone production. What are the things that we look for as signs or symptoms of low testosterone in adult males? Well, loss of libido or sex drive is a prominent finding. Erectile dysfunction can be somewhat controversial. Um, testosterone has been shown to play a significant role in getting the spontaneous nocturnal or early morning erections, and it does play a role in erectile dysfunction if the gentleman has a significantly low testosterone level. Other things that a gentleman might notice are progressive decreases in muscle mass, lethargy, altered mood. Osteoporosis is something that you might not recognize, but it is certainly associated with low testosterone. A decrease in cognitive abilities, such as an inability to focus, uh, and regression of secondary sexual characteristics, characteristics, such as facial hair, these are all signs or symptoms that might be noted uh, and might trigger a gentleman's uh, inquisition as to whether his testosterone level is low or not. Over the long term, he might notice changes in behavior, typically irritability, the decreased ability to concentrate. Um, he, we have also already discussed declining in libido. 
But most often I hear gentlemen just say they don't feel well. It's hard for them to kind of dis to really pinpoint what it is that is wrong, but they just say they don't feel like themselves. And in, in, in many men who are on testosterone replacement, when we get their levels up higher, when I ask them what the most significant change is, they just say they feel better. Um, men might notice decreased muscle mass and strength and an increase in body fat mass as well. When we're evaluating a gentleman for low mm -hmm. testosterone or hypogonadism, we'll take into account many things, including the characteristics of their secondary sexual characteristics, such as uh, body hair, uh, presence of gynecomastia, which is breast enlargement or pain. We'll evaluate the genitals and the prostate as well. In diagnosing low testosterone with lab tests, again, we talked about total testosterone versus bioavailable testosterone and free testosterone. And we'll typically measure not only the total testosterone, but also either the free or more likely the bioavailable testosterone uh, blood tests, period. It's recommended that these tests are done early in the morning as the, uh, a man's natural testosterone levels go up and down throughout the day, and they're highest uh, early in the morning, and that's when we standardize our readings. We may also order other tests that look at those signaling hormones from the brain, among other things, and including a PSA, which is a prostate-specific antigen, and a red blood cell count for reasons that we'll get into shortly. We have multiple options when we decide or discuss how we're going to actually replace testosterone. One of the oldest available ways is, are actually intramuscular injections. Subsequently, transdermal patches have been developed, and now there are actually at least four gels that are used uh, that uh, allow for testosterone absorption through the skin. There is a buckle patch, which is a patch that goes between the cheek and gum. And more recently, there have been uh, advances in testosterone pellet implants placed under the skin. Briefly, the injections are done every two to four weeks. Once a gentleman is taught how to do them, uh, typically he can do them at home. The patches are put on uh, every night. The gels are put on in varying amounts every morning. The buckle patch is, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a sachet of medication that's put between the cheek and gum twice a day. Experience has shown that these can be difficult to comply with. It's very hard to keep this patch in your mouth 24 hours a day, keeping it in your mouth at night, and I don't have many patients on this. Testosterone pellets are an increasingly common way of uh, testosterone replacement. Again, these only have to be done through a simple 15-minute office procedure under local anesthesia with uh, Novocaine. Uh, every three to four months. We do talk about the adverse effects or events that are associated with testosterone replacement. There are no oral tablets of testosterone available in the United States that are approved. These tablets, uh, some of these tablets have had significant effects on the liver and cholesterol metabolism and some have been associated with uh, heart attack and stroke and these are simply not available here in the United States. The pellet implants do require a brief procedure there's a very small risk of infection or, ex or expulsion of the pellets, but generally they're tolerated very well. Intramuscular injections can cause some fluctuations in mood or libido as the dose changes uh, over time. And the red blood cell count can actually go up uh, with any of these testosterone replacement therapies, but more likely with the injections, and we do monitor that. 20% of men who use the patches develop a rash at that site. The gels do have the potential risk for transmitting the gel to their partner or to children, and that can sometimes be a concern. And again, the, the patch that goes in the mouth has been difficult to, uh, men have found it difficult to comply with that. Are there some patients that shouldn't get testosterone replacement? Well, there are some. Uh, a gentleman who has breast cancer shouldn't get testosterone replacement therapy. It's felt as though, and there's some concern about giving testosterone replacement therapy in men who are at high risk for prostate cancer or who have prostate cancer. But we'll discuss that a little bit further. In my practice, I have several men who actually have had prostate cancer that we are placing on testosterone therapy, as has Dr. Lentz. The risks, well, liver toxicity is very rare with the approved methods of testosterone replacement. We'll talk more about the risk of prostate cancer or lack thereof. Some, there can be issues with fluid retention in some patients, um, and we do take care in prescribing testosterone replacement therapy in those patients who have congestive heart failure, for example. We also keep in mind any patients who have renal insufficiency or hepatic disease. Gynecomastia, as stated, is a rare issue with increased uh, breast size in a male. Uh, it's very uncommon and is usually related to the, the uh, 
transition of the testosterone to estrogen in the fatty tissues in men, and that can be accommodated or changed by changing the dose of the testosterone. We've talked about the increased red blood cell count that can occur, and an important fact is that there are some studies that link testosterone replacement with worsening sleep apnea. So sleep apnea should really be corrected appropriately before starting testosterone replacement. Some men are worried that if they take testosterone replacement, their prostate will grow to a larger size and that they'll notice more urinary symptoms. While it is true that testosterone replacement therapy does increase volume, it's only to that size that it would be normally if their testosterone was normal in the first place. We're not trying to raise the testosterone to super high levels. And the PSA levels, or the prostate-specific antigen levels, are, are typically decreased in men who have low testosterone and are typically only raised approximately 0.3 to 0.4 uh, nanograms per deciliter after replacement therapy. And this is typically a pretty small increase. With regard to the concept of the risk of prostate cancer or that taking testosterone therapy will cause or uncover previously undiagnosed prostate cancer, there have been multiple studies with tens of thousands of men that have suggested no association between testosterone levels and the incidence of prostate cancer. These, have, these studies have studied those men who have replaced their testosterone and compared their risk of developing prostate cancer with men who did not replace their testosterone, and the risk of prostate cancer is equal between those two groups. There's certainly no data that support the concept that testosterone therapy actually causes prostate cancer, and there are actually an increasing number of smaller studies that reveal no risk in administering testosterone to men with prostate cancer who have been treated, and even in some men who have prostate cancer but are not currently treating their, their, their cancer, there does not appear to be any exacerbation of their cancer when treated with testosterone replacement. And again, both Dr. Lentz and I have several patients in the practice who have had prostate cancer and are on testosterone replacement. That's not to say that we don't monitor them carefully, however. How do we monitor them? Well, we ask about weight gain, swelling. We evaluate them for swelling. We evaluate them for breast enlargement. But again, this is a very, very rare uh, finding with testosterone replacement. Uh, we talk about symptoms of an enlarged prostate, but again, it's not a very common finding. Um, we will also about get uh, several laboratory tests, including measuring the testosterone level, measuring their red blood cell count and their PSA, and evaluating the prostate on exam. Overall, many men report an improvement in confusion, fatigue, depression, and anger after treatment. There, uh, several studies have shown an improvement in the total number of erections, as well as nocturnal erections and attempts at intercourse, and improvement in orgasm. Testoster uh, several studies with the testosterone patch have shown an improvement in muscle mass and a decrease in fat mass. If you see here on the slide, it's a, it's a decrease of about five pounds in fat mass, so we don't purport that testosterone replacement is a weight loss therapy, but the losses in fat mass and the gain in lean muscle mass are an important advantage. And finally, bone mineral density is improved on testosterone replacement. So in conclusion, total and bioavailable testosterone levels diminish with each decade, but low testosterone in adult men can be diagnosed and treated effectively and safely. Testosterone replacement therapy can increase hormone levels to normal ranges, improve cognition and mood, enhance sexual function and activity, improve body composition and muscle strength, and increase bone mineral density. Uh, here at Duke Urology of Raleigh, Dr. Lentz and myself, uh, among others, have a very specific interest in male wellness and health. We always keep the entire patient in mind while evaluating and treating erectile dysfunction and male hypogonadism in an understanding and caring environment. And we offer complete medical and surgical management of both erectile dysfunction and low testosterone. So thank you for your attention. And I think Dr. Lentz and I are available if there are any other questions at this point. Uh, there was a question that came in that says, can low T symptoms be linked to psychological issues such as depression? Well, that's a good question. I think Dr. Lentz and I uh, both talked to our patients about the multifactorial nature of a lot of these symptoms. You know, in other words, there's a lot of reasons that a gentleman can be tired or have low sex drive or have decreased mood or lack of focus. There are some studies that do link the symptoms uh, to uh, psychological issues like depression. 
it can be a little bit tricky in teasing out whether there is uh, a true component of depression or it's actually low testosterone. I actually have one patient who was sent to me by their psychologist, psychiatrist who wanted me to replace his testosterone to a normal level because it, it was felt that his antidepressant medications would actually work even better. And he essentially wanted me to eliminate any component of mood uh, instability from his the patient's depression management. So these two issues can be linked very closely um, and certainly some component of it is related to low testosterone. I don't know if Dr. Lentz has any further input on that. No, I agree. I think all of these uh, issues are, are generally multifactorial in nature and sometimes it's difficult to tease out um, if it's the low testosterone that's causing the depression uh, or it's potentially depression that's um, leading to worsening uh, erectile dysfunction and sexual dysfunction. So I think we have to, you know, take the whole uh, picture in mind when we're uh, evaluating the patient and, and really trying to tease out how we can be the most helpful. So we have another question. Have you seen an increase in new dads experiencing intimacies, intimacy issues such as erectile dysfunction? Uh, I, we'll probably both weigh in on this. Whenever you have a, a new addition to the family, uh, and I can sort of speak from experience on this, you know, the, the level of stress that you're under at work and at home will both go up. Um, and I think that, again, getting back to the point that sexual dysfunction is never just one thing. Um, intimacy issues are just are never just one thing. It's, it's all multifactorial. And so anything that introduces more stress and less sleep into your life is going to make the uh, interactions between you and your partner a little bit more difficult, and it's going to make it potentially uh, give you more problems with erectile dysfunction as well. I'll see if Dr. Viviano has any, any more insight. No, I, I would agree. I think, you know, when we really talk to some of these patients and you really drill down on it, some of these young guys or new dads are really pretty tired, as are their partners. And sometimes the, the dads don't want to impose uh, for sexual activity. Sometimes they're just so tired um, that there's not the opportunity. Uh, certainly, um, the scheduling can be off, and there may not be as much time allotted for sexual activity as there had been in the past. So these are all issues that we talk about. And actually, um, in younger patients who otherwise had a previously uh, had have not previously had any erectile dysfunction, Dr. Lentz and I will spend time discussing it with them. But we also have the opportunity to uh, send patients um, uh, for counseling, specific sex therapy counseling, if that's something that they'd like to do to kind of tease these things out. Um, but yeah, it's not that unusual for new dads to have intimacy issues. Uh, sometimes there's, I've even had patients who are a little concerned about how early they could restart intimacy with their partner um, uh, because again, they weren't sure when the time would be right or whether they were healed from uh, their delivery, uh, delivery of their, their infant or not. New question has come up, uh, can riding a bike cause erectile dysfunction? You know, I'm, I'm actually not uh, aware of any studies that indicate long distance cycling in particular uh, increases the risk of erectile dysfunction. In general, cycling is an excellent cardiovascular exercise, and so you would think that it would have some, some protective qualities or prophylactic qualities at preserving erections. Um, I think maybe potentially a bigger risk may be in some uh, uh, extreme mountain bikers who have repetitive sudden trauma to the uh, penis and, and scrotum, which uh, potentially could cause a, a theoretical risk of damage. But in general, I'm not really aware of a, of a study that really links bike riding with erectile dysfunction. There have been, a, a, there have been one or two studies out of Europe, and, and my, in, my take on Europeans is that they ride bicycles a lot more than we do. Um, but that study actually showed that Men who cycled long distances, and these were, we, these were defined as greater than 250 miles a week, may experience erectile dysfunction or, more importantly, penile sensitivity issues. In other words, there was numbness associated with the penis, which then can actually translate into erectile dysfunction. The ability to get an erection is a very complicated, uh, multi-sense, multifactorial issue. And if the penis basically gets numb, the ability to get an erection can be compromised. I talk to my patients a little bit about 
uh, and I'm not a bicycler or a biker, but um, there are special bike seats that are kind of cut out uh, in the middle that take the pressure off the area underneath the scrotum, uh, where some of these, where some of that compression can cause problems. So I tell them if they're concerned, they can consider buying one of these special bicycle seats and using one of those. If they only bike somewhat recreationally and don't don't really go on for long distances, I don't really think it'll be much of an issue. But if they do really uh, are really committed and do a lot of long distance biking, bicycling, um, again at least 250 miles a week, it might be a consideration. Uh, there's a question that says, if I have been using the gel to treat low testosterone and my body has stopped absorbing it, what's my next move? Um, well, there are a lot of different moves um, or options. Um, one, we, we do try to figure out why uh, the gel's not working as well as it used to be. Is it uh, Typically, we, we try to get men to make sure they're giving the gels enough time to be absorbed. If you put your shirt on right uh, too soon when the gels are still somewhat wet, you're kind of just wiping off a lot of the medication and it's not getting absorbed. But there are simply some men that we just can't get up to the, the doses that we want with gels, for example. It's a, Dr. Lentz and I are seeing increasing numbers of men who are transitioning to these testosterone pellets or the Testapel pellets. Again, these are a 15-minute procedure under just local Novocaine anesthesia. It's an area high on the buttock, sort of where you would wear your wallet in your back pocket, and we deposit a very number, very number of pellets, anywhere from 8 to 12 or more pellets. Um, and then it's a simple butterfly bandage and, and, and we're done. And these pellets slowly dissolve over 3 to 4 months. And we'll check a level in 3 to 4 months, and when the level gets down close to being low again, we'll just repeat the procedure. The nice thing about the pellets is they're not transferable. In other words, women in the house don't have to be worried about getting any of the gel on them. Young children don't have access to them. They're under the skin. The complication rate is very low. The procedure is pretty simple, um, and this has been an increasing number, an increasingly popular option for a lot of men. Once the pellets are in, they don't have to put anything on every day, no gels, no patches, and a lot of men are a little uncomfortable with doing injections, but technically injections are another option for a gentleman who doesn't have the, um, uh, uh, the, the for whom the gels aren't working. And I, I was just going to, for, for to finish up on that question, uh, occasionally I will switch patients if they've been using one of the traditional gels like Testum or Androgel, which is applied to the, to the shoulder or upper back or upper chest. Um, I may also try them on Axeron, which goes uh, under, under your arm, sort of almost like a um, deodorant stick. Um, but again, I, I agree with Dr. Viviano that for those patients in whom absorption or secondary exposure is a concern, the uh, testosterone pellets have really uh, become popular in those settings. There's another question that came in that asked, do either of you have an opinion on the link between low T and Parkinson's disease? I would say if there is a link, um, it's probably most related to demographics. Uh, as patients, you know, your higher risk of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease is in your fifth or sixth decade of life. And that's along the same time when we see a natural decrease in the, uh, the bioavailable uh, testosterone levels. So it, it may simply be um, true, true, and unrelated. Um, I'm not aware of a study that, that links the development of Parkinson's disease with low testosterone. There's some really early uh, exploratory uh, studies that look into the, the dopamine uh, receptors and, and the alterations in, in dopamine metabolism in Parkinson's disease and whether and how that might affect the receptors in the brain that then send the signals down to the testicles. But there's not really a whole lot of great information clearly linking those two processes as of yet. It may come, but as of this point, I'm not aware of uh, any definitive studies. And that appears to be the end of the questions. If, any, if there are any other questions, certainly Dr. Lentz and myself are available um, at, uh, here on campus at Duke, uh, Duke Raleigh Hospital at Duke Urology at Raleigh. We'd be happy to take any other questions that anyone would have at that time.